Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the governor of the heart of Texas, Kinky Freak. TSA, the TSA, there was a woman TSA agent who shouted out, is that thing lit? And I said, to which thing, madam, are you referring? <laughs> it's kind of dangerous to play around with this <laughs> I believe I was mentioning we may have a Mormon in the White House. And one, I really do respect Romney for one thing, and that is that he uh, he feels very deeply uh, his belief in the Mormon traditional uh, marriage doctrine, which which is not same sex. It's it's same six. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have from uh, Willie Nelson this morning. An update on uh, Mother Teresa. Uh, Mother Teresa, as you know, was bugled to Jesus uh, several years ago. And apparently she was in heaven and she was looking around. And she saw uh, Princess Diana. And uh, Princess Di had a halo. And Mother Teresa did not. So, uh, she went over to Princess Diana, and she says, what gives? You know, I've spent my whole life 
try to do good works. I didn't get a halo, and I notice you have one. Well, Princess Di says, um, well, actually, this is, uh, this is not really a halo. This is a steering wheel. <laughs> song that uh, came about in the same way that I, I feel, um, I think there's something in our culture, folks. We're, we are experiencing, what the hell happened? Um, we're experiencing kind of a Barry Manilow moment in our, in our history, which is that, um, I mean, Barry Manilow has been more successful than God, you know, he really has. And uh, without taking anything away from the man, he writes and sings songs that make you feel good for a short period of time. That's what he does. And that's what I think America wants. So you see Nashville, where you have these corporate whorehouses, publishing companies with these long hallways, and in every room are two or three songwriters that have songwriting appointments trying to write songs. That's been going on for 25 or 30 years. In all that time, no one has written Sunday Morning Coming Down. I mean, no one has written Hello Wallace. So I asked, uh, I asked Willie about it just this morning, in fact, and he said, well, he said, you know, when he first got to Nashville, he was staying in, the, in Dunn's Trailer Park, which was the lowest rent trailer park in town on, in East Nashville. <clears throat> and between the veteran cemetery and the used car lot. And he had three kids and a wife. And he was broke, drunk most of the time. And um, he had one friend who came to visit him. And that was uh, Roger Miller. And in the next trailer, the next trailer had a sign on it that said, trailer for sale or rent. <laughs> <laughs> That's how the great songs are written. <laughs> anyway, this one, this one is, I borrowed the title of the uh, insurance company for the uh, Grand Ole Opry, the Nashville Life and Casualty Insurance Company. And I twisted it around a bit. And... The song just sort of wrote itself one night. I mean, I don't even think I was at home at the time. <laughs> and the song reflects the story of D. Ford Bailey, the first black entertainer on the Grand Ole Opry, played there in Monica. And when he got off the Opry or whatever happened, the rest of his life was very tragic. <clears throat> and the, by the way, the Nashville Life and Casualty Insurance Company sponsored the Opry for 50 or 60 years. They no longer do. There is a new sponsor to take their place. Would anyone here like to hazard a guess at who the new sponsor is? No, Martha White's flower is probably still there. That's, I'm asking who replaced the Nashville Life and Casualty. Very shocked. Geico is a very educated guest, but it's not correct. So no. <laughs> Any other ideas? Goo candy bars. Well, Goo Goo, I think it's still. I think they still do that. Yeah. We've had uh, Halliburton, a whole bunch of other uh, suggestions. The the new sponsor is, of course, Wal Walmart. It's Walmart. And, and um, I have to be careful because I might be a Walmart greeter if my career goes any further south. As you know, folks, this is all an experiment tonight. It's not really a show. It's 25 shows in 26 days called the Bipolar Tour. And I have with me uh, a woman, uh, a doctor, traveling on the tour with me. And you, you, you will meet her in a moment. But um, 
You will recall the last person to bring a doctor on tour with him was Michael Jackson. <laughs> you know how that one ends. At any rate, here is, uh, here, here is the song. In faded Gabardine, he used to stand Down by the Union Station with that old hat in his hand A banjo-picking devil, a singing ragtime saint The young folks called him beautiful and the old folks called him quaint And the station master pointed to the sign Busted him for loitering when he was making memories rhyme. Out in the falling snow, he'd sing his song to a world too cold to listen and too white to sing along. Just a Nashville casualty in life. Don't left here without a dime. Ever since the good Lord took his wife, he'd find him strumming on a corner all the time. And most of Music City never saw the world within the song of a Nashville casualty and life goes on. The attic sets a dusty hat and cane And the kids that found a banjo They're all rusted from the rain I strummed a little rusty ragtime beat And I sang for every soul out on the street I could almost see him standing in the rain His black and blind Face, reflecting all the pain of all the time and people passing by and all the ringing memories that can make a banjo cry just a Nashville casualty of life it's a riff that's held to play Sings for you living on the street And Lord, you yeah, sleeps in the back of some cafe And most of Music City never sees The world within the song Of a Nashville casualty And life goes on sorry tonight not to have Kinky Friedman's Man in Black Tequila here with us tonight. We were going to have a tequila tasting, but the shipment uh, did not make it. Uh, I don't, well, but I am drinking Mexican mouthwash. Uh, I used to drink uh, Guinness on stage. Uh, but thank you very much. The drink that kept the Irish from taking over the world. <laughs> I think, uh, I think Freud, Sigmund Freud said that the only people who are impervious to psychoanalysis are the Irish. Uh, Man of Black Tequila is uh, really the rage in Texas right now, but it's not distributed outside of Texas. So the only way to get it is to call a friend, find a friend in Texas, ask him to send you some. And it'll be doing you a real favor. This is uh, the best Mexican mouthwash you will ever gargle. Okay, this is not uh, Kinky Freeman's Man in Black Tequila right here. This is 
some other Mexican mouthwash. Um, Man in Black salutes Zorro, Paladin, and Johnny Cash. <laughs> about those three, they, they had something more in common than just wearing black. They had a moral clarity that if it was manifested in Washington today, the country would be in great shape. <laughs> anyway, our, uh, we like to say that this is not your father's tequila, this is your grandfather's gardener's tequila. <laughs> Our slogan is, find what you like and let it kill you. <laughs> this is pretty good stuff. John, what is this? Patron. What? Patron? Uh, Peruvian marching dollars. See, here's what I don't like about Patron. It's been filtered about 200 times in stainless steel to be totally homogenized, sanitized, and trivialized. <laughs> And I have two taste buds left. <laughs> They're telling me this is okay. Okay, but this is not what you want. All of uh, Man in Black's filtering is done in clay. It's done the old-fashioned way, the way the old Mexicans used to do it. And uh, I mean, just give it a shot, folks, when you get a chance. Uh, next time I see you, I may be a big uh, tequila magnate. <laughs> I may also be wheeled in on a gurney. <laughs> anyway, folks, just surviving the bipolar is quite an experience. I'm 67, though uh, many of you know that I, I read at the 69-year-old level. <laughs> and my last will and testament is now complete. When I die, I'm to be cremated. <clears throat> the ashes are to be thrown. <clears throat> this Patron really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> the ashes are to be thrown in Rick Perry's hair. <laughs> you know, Rick has brought a very interesting dynamic to Texas. He's changed the political landscape once and for all. Um, now we we find that all of the uh, the Aggies and the Blondes are telling Rick Perry jokes. <laughs> so uh, here's the first song I ever wrote. I was 11 years old when I wrote it. Um, it's a little children's song. Anybody bring their kids tonight? <laughs> Adult children qualify. You got it. This song has, uh, is very well known around the world and yet has not been a financial pleasure to the Kingster. It's incredible. Um, there were some little kids here earlier. I don't know what happened to them. One thing about the Kingster, I never like to say fuck in front of a C-H-I-L-D. <laughs> those of you, those of you who really know this music from the 70s, the people I refer to as insects trapped in amber, um, you will know who the big star was who played slide dobro on old Ben Lucas. Now, most of us don't know that sort of thing. Um, so let me tell you just a, a brief little story. About uh, 1976, we were taking a break from uh, the Bob Dylan tour, the Rolling Thunder Review. And I was in the Troubadour in Los Angeles, a club where all the musicians used to hang out. And I was at the bar, I think I was having a diet hemlock. <laughs> And a guy comes up to me, he's wearing a, a kind of a riverboat gambler cowboy hat. He's got red, a red stubble, kind of a red thing on his chin and red facial hair. Not a very tall guy. And I thought, man, and the guy, it comes right up 
to my elbow, you know, and he's sitting there, he orders a drink, and he's saying, um, uh, Kingster, let's have another drink, whatever, you know, he's talking, he knows me, he knows me intimately, <laughs> seemingly. And, and so I, I'm trying to think, you know, this guy must be Ray Wiley Hubbard or Rusty Weir, who has since been bugled to Jesus. It's got to be some Texas singer-songwriter, but I wasn't sure which one. I didn't know who the hell he, exactly he was. So I tried to, to find out. I, I, you know, I asked him where he'd been, what's going on, and he kind of, uh, you know, he was telling me all this. He wasn't evading me, but, but he would not reveal who he was. Nothing I could say to the guy would tell me who he was. For sure, a very friendly guy, whatever. Obviously knew me. And, so we went into the men's room, and we did some uh, Peruvian marching power. <laughs> and then uh, we came back out. Now, I think Joni Mitchell was playing there that night. We, I mean, we were there now for six hours, mm -hmm. the two of us, at this bar. And I still did not know who the hell he was, so it was getting <laughs> awkward, let's say. So finally, I'd had enough of this shit. I said to the guy, look, look, I hate to do this, but... To but what is your name? And he says, Eric Clapton. <laughs> so that was how I met Eric. <laughs> now there's, a, there's a little companion piece to this. I think two Eric Clapton stories is probably too much for one show, but this is a quickie. Ray Price, one of the greatest. Um, Ray Price, the country singer. Um, had a Hispanic drummer, who still has a name, Ferdy. And Ferdy um, knew that Eric Clapton was a huge fan of Ray Price's. So they were at this big festival with about 50 artists, and those two happened to be two of the artists there. So Ferdy went to Eric's people and he said, hey, would Eric like to meet Ray Price? So Eric himself comes out of the dressing room and he says, would I like to meet Ray Price? It'd be the honor of a lifetime. So Ferdy, the drummer, takes Eric over to Ray's dressing room. And he brings him in and he says, Ray Price, Eric Clapton. And Eric comes over to Ray and says, Ray, I've got to tell you, I'm not a fan of yours. I'm a disciple. I have every single song you've ever performed or recorded on my personal discography. He says, this is, this is, the honor of a lifetime to meet you. And um, Ray, always a southern gentleman, you know, comes forward and shakes hands with him. He says, well, thank you very much, Mr. Crampton. <laughs> no clues to who he was. <laughs> uh, so much for this. If you know the song, please help me out with it. Old man Lucas had a lot of mucus coming right out of his nose. He'd pick and pick till it made you sick, but back again it grows. Eleven years old, when I wrote the dad. <laughs> when it's cotton picking time in Texas, boys, it's booger picking time for men. He'd raise that finger, being hostile, sticking in that waiting nostril. Here he comes with a green one once again. Right, everybody. Old man Lucas had a lot of mucus coming right out of his nose. He'd pick and pick till it made you sick, but back again it grows. Once more, old man Lucas had a lot of mucus coming right out of his nose. He'd pick and pick till it made you sick, but back Send this out to the uh, memory and the music of Levon Helm. Uh, the song was written by the great Tom Paxton. He was a man and a friend always. He stuck with me in my heart all day. He never came. 
Even if I had no dough, we rambled around in the rain and sun. And here's to you, my rambling boy. May all your rambling bring you joy. that we, we might work one day. The boss said he had room for one. Said my old pal, we'd rather bond. Texas, uh, the first mass murderer in America, hmm. modern mass murderer, thank you very much, <laughs> uh, in America was in Texas on the Texas Tower, a fellow named Charles Joseph Whitman. And uh, two nights ago in Boston, I met a guy who knew him very well, who was in the same engineering class with Charles Whitman. He said he was the sweetest guy, wonderful guy. Never would have figured that. And um, one morning, Whitman got up, killed his wife, his mother-in-law, which is understandable. But <laughs> then he climbed the Texas Tower, and I think he killed about 26 more people. And you know, he he was an A student, uh, close to an A student. He was an Eagle Scout. He uh, former Marine sharpshooter, and of course. Very soon after he started shooting, there were all these pickup trucks started circling the tower, lined up, and uh, guys got out with their hunting rifles to shoot back at him. And you had a real, real scene there. Um, at any rate, this is uh, the Ballad of Charles Whitman, a very misunderstood and underrated song of mine. <laughs> He was sitting up there for more than an hour, way up there on the Texas Tower, shooting from the 27th floor. Hey, he 
didn't choke or slash or slip them. Not our Charles Joseph Whitman. He won't be an architect no more. I got up that morning, calm and cool. Picked up his guns and walked to school. All the while he smiled so sweetly. Then he blew their minds completely. They never seen a evil scout so cruel. Don't you think of the shame and degradation for the school's administration? He put on such a bold and brassy show. The chancellor cried his adolescent, and of course it's most unpleasant, but I gotta admit, twas a lovely way to go. There was a rumor about a timber that's that face of his brain. Six Michael, laughing wildly as he back. Who are we to say the boys in the slang? <laughs> now Charlie was awful disappointed. Elsie thought he was anointed to do a deed so low down and so mean. Students looked up from their classes and he stopped and scratched their asses. who not believe he'd once been a Marine. Now Charlie made the honor roll with ease. Most all of his grades was A's and B's. A real rip snorting, trigger squeezer. Charlie proved a big crowd pleaser, though he had been known to make a couple of C's. Some were dying, some were weeping, some were studying, some were sleeping. Some were shouting, Texas number one. <laughs> <laughs> some were running, some were falling. Some were screaming, some were bawling. Some thought the revolution had begun. <laughs> the doctors tore him, tore brain down. But not a snitch of illness could be found. Most folks could figure just why he did it. Then the good would not admit it. There's still a lot of Eagle Scouts around. <laughs> there was a rumor about a tumor. That's the face of his brain. He was sitting up there with his 36 back, laughing wildly as he backed up. Who are we to say the boys in? Say the boys in Who are we to say the boys in sing yeah. right, Folks, I promised you if you meet my doctor, let's bring her up here. Uh, Amy? All right. Uh, let's welcome uh, It turns out not only is she a very good doctor of alternative medicine, <laughs> but she also is a very original singer-songwriter. And I only found this out last week, so, so let us welcome, and by the way, the song she wrote herself, listen to this one very carefully. This song, when I heard it first, which was a week ago, knocked my dick to my watch pocket, <laughs> as I used to say in Nashville. <laughs> this is the hit song. Uh, so let us welcome Dr. Amy Love. She's going to do a few songs. Mr. 
lot of men did, and a lot of men died. I got one fist of iron, the other of steel. The right one don't get you, the left one me. accessible to modern people and their high-tech proclivities. So uh, this is one of my old songs that I've kind of retitled. It's now called Waitress, Please Waitress, Come Sit on My Facebook. <laughs> As you know, if you're singing with us, you pronounce the words, Waitress, please, Waitress, come sit on my fate. <laughs> the cities in the song are Daddy, Autumn, and Eden. <laughs> and of course, you know how Texans pronounce the word Jewish, always with one syllable, he's Jewish. <laughs> Except the word Jew, which has multiple syllables. That's how that goes. He married a Jew. 
fixed and a faggot by 50. <laughs> Many of these I've achieved. Some have it eluded me. A real Texas song for you. Texas, where the men are men and the emus are nervous. <laughs> we now We don't swap our wives with our neighbors And we keep our kids away from Mexico And I'm proud to be an asshole from El Paso I like it here, place where sweet young virgins are Be my friend We walk down the street deep in tacos T-t-t-tacos and the wet bags still get 20 cents an hour. All right, all right, come on.
don't wipe our asses on old glory. <laughs> Got a lone star beer of things we trust. We keep our women virgins until they're married. So hoes and sheep is good enough for us. An hour. Everybody in Washington. I'm proud to be an asshole from El Paso. There's a bird on my back, a place where sweet young virgins are devoured. Make a wati. He walked down the street, he deep in enchiladas, enchiladas, and the wet bag still get 20 cents an hour. an hour. Georgia, can't get. Well, 
was on a rainy Wednesday morning. That's the day that I was born. And old share crop was one room country shack. They say my mama let me was the same day that you had me. She hit the road and never was back. Well, I just saw the mention. My grandma's old invention is the reason why I'm standing here today. I got all my country learning, just a milking and a churning, picking top, present hip, bailing hay. Well, I've been to Georgia on a fast train, honey, and I wasn't born on yesterday. But I got a good Christian raising and a great education, and there ain't a use y'all treat me this way. Sweet Carolina, I don't believe I'll find another woman put together like you are. While I like go wiggle and you're walking, your big city talking, and your brand new shiny Plymouth rag top car. Give and take, it seems like haste makes waste every time. Well, I'm glad you were so when you hear them angels roll. Well, you best believe I get my share of mine. I've been to Georgia on a fast train, honey. And I wasn't born no yesterday. I got a good Christian raising and a great education. And there ain't the use your treatment. fast approaching and anybody who uh, is lucky enough to have a father uh, this is the time to remember him and let him know that you love him and uh, I'd like to recommend uh, this book which is uh, Otto Boy at the Window and uh, it's written by a friend of mine who's here tonight and uh, it was actually two guys uh, Peter Abels who the story actually happened to and Tom Hicks Tom is a very happy Christian, and uh, Peter is, of course, a G. <laughs> um, a Jew, a very lucky one. Um, gentlemen, do you just want to say a, a word about this, or do you want me to? Okay. Um, let me say that I was very inspired by this book, and there ain't many things that have inspired the Kingster. And there ain't many ways to inspire anybody anymore. You almost have to see some geezer like Christofferson, or Merle, or Bob Dylan, or Willie, or Billy Joe. I mean, you will not find inspiration. You know, I'll probably get hammered in this, but I'm telling you, the whole, it's not that there's no talent, but I don't see a young John Lennon or a young Jimi Hendrix coming up here. I don't know, this could be Billy Bob Thornton is correct that the internet, through the internet, the audience has become the show. And so there will never be any more heroes. There will just be product. There will be Lady Gaga, there will be Justin Bieber. So if that be the case, um, I really think you should go, we will have Peter and Tom will be signing books with me afterwards, okay? So I really recommend picking up uh, Otto the Boy at the Window. It's a, it, it is almost a surrealistic story. I mean, it's very, but it's a very accurate, true tale of what happened to Peter, who got out of Austria just in time. Um, and so uh, for Peter tonight, um, I'd like to send out this next song. Right. 
six million miles How the smoke from camps arising See the helpless creatures on their way Hey old pal, ain't it surprising American 
Girl, the times is finished and the one adds all our red. Everyone's been sold American. Of a morning love, haunted by the metro for killing time and pain, with a singing brakeman screaming through your veins. And everything has been so American. A lonely night is morning for the death it never dies. Everyone's been so American. Don't let me catch you laughing when the jukebox cries. You told me you were born so much higher than life, but I've seen the faded pictures of your children. Now they're fumbling through your wallet and they're trying to find your name. It's almost like they raise the price of fame. And everything's been so American. No place to go, and brother. No place to stay. Texas childhood, 23 heroes of mine when I was a kid. Um, this idea was the idea of Jim Hightower, who is, some of you know who Jim Hightower is, don't you? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. But Jim is to the left of... Che <laughs> <laughs> <Jake> Guevara, probably. <laughs> uh, Jim, um, but he's a real populist, he's a good man. And Jim suggested that if I want people to know who I am, tell them who your heroes are. So if I ask you, sir, who are your heroes, and you told me um, Bill Gates, Donald Trump, and um, the aforementioned Justin Bieber, <laughs> yeah, we know who you are pretty much. So. So anyway, when I start writing this, I noticed that the, the tragic nature of all of these people was something I hadn't thought about before. I mean, the, their lives are filled with obstacles, failure, and tragedy. That's what made them heroes, how they overcame those things. Um, this is a story about my own dad who died 12 years ago. The story is kept in the first person. I recommend everybody keep everybody a love in the first person as long as you possibly can. In the present tense. Um, so, while we have this book to sign, we'll have uh, Otto the boy at the window. Peter and I will, will be signing these. These will make great Father's Day gifts. Maybe you've got a spiritual father. But um, maybe you don't. But if you got somebody to give this book to, sign them. We'll be out there. And of course, as you know, I will sign anything but bad legislation. <laughs> the story is called Tom Friedman, The Navigator. 
because I'm the oldest living Jew in Texas who doesn't own real estate, <laughs> and given my status in general as a colorful character, there are those who profess to be surprised that I ever indeed had a father or a mother. I assure you, I had both. For many years, my parents owned and directed Echo Hill Ranch, a summer camp near Kerrville, where I grew up, or maybe just got older. <laughs> I remember my dad, Tom Friedman, talking to all the campers on Father's Day in the dining hall after lunch. Each summer, he'd say essentially the same words. For those of you who are lucky enough to have a father, Now's the time to remember him and let him know that you love him. Write a letter home today. Many years, hell, many lifetimes have passed since I last heard Tom's message to the campers. But love, I suppose, has no sell-by date. When my father was a young boy, growing up in the Chicago of the late 20s, his first job was working for a Polish peddler. The man had a horse and cart that was loaded up with fruits and vegetables. Tom sat on the very top. Through the streets and alleys of the old west side they'd go, with the peddler crying his wares in at least five languages. And my father, running the purchases up to the housewives, who lived on the top floors of the tenement building. There were trolley cars then, and colorful clotheslines strung across the city alleys like medieval banners. My father still remembers the word the peddlers seemed to cry out more than any other. The word was kartoffel. It is Polish for potato. In November 1944, my mother, Minnie, gave birth to me in a manger somewhere on the south side of Chicago. <laughs> I lived there one year, couldn't find work, and moved to Texas, <laughs> where I haven't worked since. <laughs> and all this time, my father was far away, fighting for his country and his wife and a baby boy he might never see. Tom was a navigator in World War II, flying a heavy bomber for the 8th Air Force. The old B-24, known as the Liberator, which, in time, it was. Tom's plane was called the I've Had It. He flew 35 successful missions over Germany, the last occurring on November 9th, 1944 two days after he learned that he was a brand new father. As the navigator, the responsibility fell to him to bring the 10-man crew back safely. In retrospect, it's not terribly surprising that fate and the powers that be had selected Tom to be the navigator. He was the only one aboard the I've Had It who possessed a college degree. He was also oldest man on the plane. He was 23 years old. After each successful mission, <clears throat> it was a custom to paint a small bomb on the side of the plane. In the rare instance of shooting down an enemy plane, a swastika was painted. When one incoming crew, however, accidentally hit a British runway maintenance worker, a small teacup was painted on the side of his <laughs> Practically engendering an international incident. <laughs> yes, Tom was a hero. He was a hero in what he still refers to as the last good war. For his efforts, he received the Distinguished Flying Cross and the Air Medal with three oak leaf clusters and the heartfelt gratitude of his crew. Yet the commanding officer's first words to Tom and his young compatriots had not been wrong. The CO had told them to look at the man on their left and to look at the man on their right. When you return, he had said, 
they will not be here. This dire prophecy proved to be correct. The mighty eighth suffered a grievous attrition rate during the height of the war. After the war, Tom and men settled in Houston, where Tom pioneered community action programs. Men became one of the very first speech therapists in the Houston public schools. In the late 50s, I moved to Austin, where Tom was a professor of educational psychology at the University of Texas. It was in 1953, however, that my parents made possibly their greatest contribution to children far and wide by opening Echo Hill Ranch. My mother passed away in 1985, but Tom, known as Uncle Tom to the kids, still runs the camp. Like most true war heroes, Tom rarely talks about the war. My sister, Marcy, once saw Tom sitting alone in a darkened room and asked, Is everything all right, Father? To this, Tom replied, The last time everything was all right was August 14th, 1945. <laughs> that was the day Japan surrendered. On a recent trip to O'Hare Airport in Chicago, I commandeered a limo and drove through the area where Tom had grown up. There were slums and suburbs and Starbucks. But the trolley cars and the clotheslines and the peddler with his horse and cart were gone. Cartoffel, I said to the limo driver, but he just looked straight ahead. Either he wasn't Polish or he didn't want any potatoes. <laughs> Today, Tom lives in Austin with his new wife, Edith Kruger, and his two dogs, Sam and Perky. He has three children and three grandchildren. He eats lunch at the Frisco, still plays tennis with his old pals. He did not, as he contends, Teach me everything I know. <laughs> Only almost everything. He taught me tennis. He taught me chess. He taught me how to belch. He taught me to always stand up for the underdog. He taught me the importance of treating children like adults and adults like children. He's a significant American because by his example, his spirit, and his unseen hand, he's guided children of all ages safely through the winding, often torturous courses of their lives. One of them was me. Tom's war is long over. Indeed, the whole era seems gone like the crews who never came home, lost forever among the salt shaker stars. And yet when the future may look its darkest, there sometimes occurs an oddly comforting moment when with awkward grace, the shadow of a silver plane flies inexplicably close to my heart. One more mission for the navigator. this uh, company store business because it tends not to be a financial pleasure because people have to go buy the book in the store and they come over and meet us. But Peter, where are you? Are you there? Um, uh, Peter and uh, Tom, two very special guys. They'll be with me. If you have a chance, come on over and uh, talk to both of them. You won't regret it. And uh, you guys will graciously uh, sign anything but bad legislation, won't you? <laughs> yeah? Okay, they will. 
Los Alamos will also have CDs of, uh, of Brian Molnar and, uh, and Amy Love. And uh, so we'll be over there. Come over and say hello, folks. We'll be there for a while. Get a gift for Father's Day. Another book I'd like to recommend is Billy Bob Thornton's book, um, The Billy Bob Tapes, A Cave Full of Ghosts. That is a good one. Um, in October, Willie and I have a book coming out called Just As I Am, which is a book that I actually had to, to write some of it. I didn't, on the Billy Bob book, he did it all himself. Um, and it reminded me of the time recently, a little last year, I guess, when Willie was busted, coming over the Mexican border on his bus. And I saw him the next day, and, and he, he looked terrible. I mean, he looked like he just lost six ounces, you know what I mean? <laughs> the same day, later that afternoon, later that afternoon, I saw and something that I will, will forever be emblazoned upon my scrotum. I will never, never forget this. And this is the image of Willie Nelson in handcuffs signing autographs for law enforcement personnel. <laughs> That's why we call him the hillbilly dolly 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 dolly. I don't like this. Uh... I recommend not drinking Patron. It's kind of the, you know, it's the Coke or whatever it is. It's the, the most popular tequila right now, but Give us a little time. Man in black going to keep him. <laughs> John, what is it? Is this Patron? John? <laughs> yes, sir. I'm feeling slightly suicidal. <laughs> is, this, is this Patron or? Yes, sir, it, is. it is Patron. The best I had for you. Okay. Well. You will get man in black? You won't regret it, God damn it. I'll tell you to your fate. <laughs> I'm going to send this out to uh, E.Y. Hubbard. I want to send this out to uh, Mary Lee and Shelby Coffee. Um, who. That's right, right? It just sounds wrong. Yeah. Shelby? Yeah. You hear? Okay. Um, you will see how these people, they helped a friend of mine who was this large, drunken albino named John Walsh, <laughs> who I apparently will see at the next couple of shows. Uh, we'll get into that in a minute. But uh, let us back up just a pace here. We're sending out to you guys. This is... Um, Barbara Jordan is one of the people in Heroes of a Texas Childhood. And I, I know you guys were in Washington, but I'll tell you right now, when I finished the book and I showed it to all the young counselors at my parents' camp from colleges all over Texas, college kids and recent graduates, they never heard of Barbara Jordan. Right. They never heard of Molly Ivins. Mm. And they never heard of Audie Murphy. <laughs> so, I mean, I was dumbfounded. I, I couldn't believe it. They didn't know who these, they didn't have a clue. And um, really, we would have to say Zorro, Paladin, <laughs> Johnny Cash, and Barbara Jordan. That's what we need to know the country for that. That would be great, folks. So, Barbara Jordan was the first politician I ever heard. She should have been president. She should have been a Supreme Court justice. If there was any justice, she should have been. And really, it is true that the crowd always picks Barabbas. They always say, free Barabbas, kill Jesus. Every time. That's what happens. So when an FDR or a JFK or a Reagan or an Ann Richards or a Winston Churchill slips through, it's an accident. These people can see beyond the horizon. 
I mean, these people don't have Neville Chamberlain written all over them. <laughs> and a beautiful thing in the uh, in the book, The Last Lion, by by uh, William Manchester. Well, this is a really erudite audience. <laughs> <laughs> you, just, you can lean on you people. <laughs> by William Manchester, he points out that the tragedy of Neville Chamberlain's life was that he lived long enough to see how he would be remembered. Mm. And Churchill was very gracious with him, very gracious. But it didn't matter, I mean, Chamberlain knew he was a smart guy, he knew. And um, so from Obama to Ron Paul, you can see a lot of Neville Chamberlain, a lot of people perpetually behind the curve politicians. That's where they like to stay. That's why I requested that all of these people be limited to two terms, one in office and one in prison. <laughs> so Barbara Jordan was the first politician I ever heard say, and this was in the 60s, that political correctness would drown America if we didn't watch it. And we're there today, folks. We are there. I'm telling you, if a young Richard Pryor walked in here tonight, we could not make him a mainstream star in our country. We could make him a, a Kinky Friedman. We could make him a Graham Parsons. We could make him a Warren Zevon, a Van Dyke Parks. We could not make him a Barry Manilow or a Justin Bieber. Could not <laughs> and the same is true with a young George Carlin or a Mel Brooks or a young Lenny Bruce. And for God's sakes, we couldn't make the movie Blazing Saddles. <laughs> but thank the Lord, at least we have this song. Well, a redneck nerd in a bowling shirt was a guzzling on a star Talking religion and a politics for all the world to hear. They ought to send you back to Russia, boy, or New York City one. You just want to doodle a Christian girl and you kill God's only son. <laughs> I said, has it occurred to you, you nerd, that that's not very we Jews believe it was Santa Claus that killed Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, you don't look Jewish, he said, near as I could figure. I had you lamped for a slightly anemic, well-dressed country nigger. <laughs> And spit on the floor. Lord. I ain't making Jews like Jesus said more. He says, No, I ain't a racist. But Aristotle Onassis is one Greek we don't need. About <laughs> niggers, Jews, and Sigma News. All they ever do is breathe. <laughs> and wops and mix and slopes and spicks and spooks are on my list. And there's one little heap from the heart of Texas. <laughs> there anyone I miss? <laughs> you know, folks, when I used to sing this many years ago at the Lone Star Cafe, back when Christ was a cowboy. <laughs> When doctors drove Buicks. <laughs> when the redneck in the bar said, Is there anyone I missed? My old pal John Walsh, large, drunken albino, would stand up and shout, Albinos! <laughs> <laughs> and there was a black manager in the club named Lee Frazier. And we would close the song with Lee Frazier. John Walsh and me, all singing a cappello, the last chorus of the song, kind of a brotherhood in action kind of thing. And 
Then as I traveled around the country, an interesting thing started happening. There would always be one person who really had their hip card punched in every crowd. You could be in Seattle. Somebody would shout, albinos. Just <laughs> the rest of the audience wouldn't know what they were talking about. So they'd been to New York and seen the show, or in the great folk tradition, word had filtered to them about John Walsh shouting albino. This went on for years. And then finally, less and less did people shout albinos. And finally one day it disappeared altogether. The story has a happy ending. I think, uh, I think Shelby Coffey <laughs> saved John Walsh. Shelby threw him a lifeline, gave him a job there, and John had terrific talent. And um, all he needed was a break, and Shelby gave him one. And that's my understanding. And um, the story has a happy ending, since John is one of the top executives of the ESPN television networks today. I think you can say he's the most influential albino in America today. <laughs> This is, is a kind of old song, singer-songwriter technique where you tell a long, laborious story in the middle of a song, <laughs> and then you see if you can still come back and save the song. <laughs> well, I hit him with everything I had right square between the eyes. I says, I'm going to get you, you son of a bitch, you spout that pack of lies. If there's one thing I can't abide, it's an ethnocentric racist. Now you take back that shit you said about Aristotle or Nasa. <laughs> Okay, okay, we'll get that out to you. This is the, um, 
<laughs> All right, this was 1973 at the University of Buffalo, um, where uh, the Texas Jew Boys sang uh, this song, and a group of, shall we say, cranked up lesbians attacked the stage. <laughs> the equipment and they were fighting the Texas Jew boys and they were winning. <laughs> so the cops were called, the cops gave us an escort off of campus. <laughs> Think of that year I received the Male Chauvinist Pig of the Year Award from the National Organization for Women. <laughs> Which I'm still very proud of. <laughs> uh, here's the song. You uppity women, I don't understand Why you gotta go and try to act like a man But before you make your weekly visit to the shrink You better occupy the kitchen Liberate the sink so that Occupy? I was way ahead of my time Get your biscuits in the oven and your box in the bed That's what I do, my baby said Woman's liberation is a goal to your head. Get your biscuits in the oven and your buns in the bed. <laughs> Early every morning you're out on the street, passing out the pamphlets to everyone you meet. You gave up your maiden form for Lent. Now the front of your dress has an air scoop vent. <laughs> every single great man who's ever come along I had a little woman always telling him he's wrong. Eve said to Adam, here's an apple, you hog. And Delilah defoliated Samson's moss. Get your biscuits in the oven and your buns in the bed. That's what I to my baby said. Woman's liberation is a going to your head. Get your biscuits in the oven and Minded harpies are breaking all the laws, tearing up the girdles and burning up the bras. Now the air is dirty and the sex is clean, and your coffee makes my hair turn green. It's so old, damn emancipated in your mind and your body. I'm gonna have to cancel all your lessons in karate. If you can't love a male to shop a this, you better cross me off of your shopping list. Get your biscuits in the oven and your buns in the bed. That's what I to my baby said. Woman's liberation is a going to your head. Get your biscuits in the oven and your buns in the bed. This is the, uh, I also want to remind you folks, uh, if, if you're driving this evening, uh, don't forget your car. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is, uh, this is a song that I uh, learned when I was maybe seven or eight years old off a record that I believe was by Paul Robeson who had one of the greatest voices of the age. And I can't imagine who else. I think it was Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson was a black communist. He was singing to a little Jewish kid in Texas about a, an Irish Catholic hero. And um, once I internalized that song as a kid, I did not sing or perform it for maybe 40 or 50 years. I, I, I forgot the song, but I never really forgot it. When I toured Ireland about seven years ago, the, the fragment started coming back to me. And finally I had what I thought was the story. And um, the Irish promoter suggested not to do the song. He mm -hmm. said it's a very political song in Ireland. The result will be fist fights in the audience and people pandemonium and people, you know, will leave the concert alone. You know, it's a mistake. So I listened to him. I didn't do it. And the first time I started doing it was on this bipolar tour. 
about five nights ago, and the song has been uh, going down really well. Um, so, uh, here is the story about the 1916 Easter uprising in Ireland. Uh, somebody said it. A Jewish kid is not supposed to know this story. Most people in America don't seem to know it, but um, they really understand it, they really like it. Uh, so uh, thanks to all of you um, for coming down here tonight, and uh, thanks to Paul Robeson, and here is, as I remember it, now you could Google, Google Jesus, you know, or Google Kevin Barry and you may get a different, slightly different version. But this is my version as I remember it, and that's what I think um, folk tradition is all about. This is the Ballad of Kevin Barry. Early on a Sunday morning, high up in a gallows tree, Kevin Barry gave his young life for the cause of liberty. Only a lad of 18 summers, yet there's no one can deny. When he went to death that morning, nobly held his head up high. Shoot me like an Irish soldier, do not hang me like a dog. For I fought for Ireland's freedom on that bright September morn All around that little bakery where we fought them hand to hand Shoot me like an Irish soldier for I fought to free our land On that morning that they left him down there in his lonely cell British soldiers tortured Barry just because he wouldn't tell them the names of his brave companions and other things they wish to know turn in former and we'll free you proudly Barry answered no Shoot me like an Irish soldier, do not hang me like a dog. For I fought for Ireland's freedom on that bright September morn. All around that little bakery, where we fought them hand to hand. Shoot me like an Irish soldier, for I fought to free our land. Another martyr for dear Ireland. Another murder for the crown. Brutal laws to crush the Irish never break our spirit down. Lads like Barry are no cowards. From the foe they never fly and their courage always has been Ireland's cause to live or die shoot me like an Irish soldier do not hang me like a dog for I fought for Ireland's freedom on that bright September morn all around where we fought them hand to hand Shoot me like an Irish soldier For a fall To free
so messed up, and, and yet could see beyond the horizon. I mean, this guy was grappling with a future that most people couldn't see. And uh, this song proves it. This one song has, describes America today probably better than any other song I know. Uh, so here is uh, Woody Guthrie's song, Pretty Boy Floyd, as performed by Kiki Friedman. <laughs> uh, let's see if and, uh, anyway, folks, it's, uh, it's really been one of the most stultifyingly dull evenings of not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a wonderful evening and uh, may the God of your choice bless you. Hope to talk to everyone outside there. Okay, practicing to be a Walmart greeter. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much. story I will tell about pretty boy Floyd the outlaw, Oklahoma knew him well. T'was in a town of Shawnee on a Saturday afternoon, with his wife beside him in a wagon. It was in the town he Well, a deputy sheriff called him in a matter rather rude, using vulgar words of language. And his wife, she overheard. Well, pretty boy grabbed a log chain, the deputy grabbed a gun. And in the fight that followed, he laid that deputy down. He took to the woods and timbers. He lived a life of shame. Every crime in Oklahoma was laid unto his name. He took to the river bottoms along your North Canadian shore, and many a starving farmer opened up his door From many a little farmer the same old story goes how pretty boy paid their mortgage and he saved their little home They'd tell about a stranger who came to beg a meal and underneath his napkin Left a thousand dollar bill In Oklahoma City It was on a Christmas day Come a whole wagon load full of groceries And a note on which did say You say that I'm an outlaw You say that I'm a thief Here's a Christmas dinner for your family's on relief. Now around this world I've rambled, I've seen many funny men. Some will rob you with a six gun and some with a fountain pen. But as through your lives you ramble by as through your lives you roam You'll never see an outlaw Drive a family from